Hi, I'm Sean Mooney, Professor and Chief Research Information Officer of UW Medicine at the University of Washington. In this video, four faculty from our Department of Medicine will present talks titled Adopting AI into Clinical Care. Please remember to register below to receive communications on future videos and live seminars. We hope you enjoy these. Questions. So welcome to the first of the um, AI and data science and medicine seminars at the University of Washington in December. We'll, we are doing a seminar uh, today and we'll do another one next week. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that we are, um, please register your interest in the REDCAP form that comes into those emails that I badger you with every, every couple of weeks so that we can uh, make sure that you'll get the announcements. Eventually we're gonna not use, we're gonna use that list instead of the list that I sort of organically, uh, I non-organically grew on my, my end. Um, and if you have, if your department has any seminars or other events that you think are really worthwhile to in, uh, include, I'm happy to include them on those emails. Um, and also when you get those emails, take a look at the bottom. I've got a list of other seminars and events that might be of interest to you. Um, we are recording these and we'll be making them available sh uh, shortly if presenters uh, agree. All the presenters so far have agreed. We have those videos available. Um, and we are working with University of Washington video to put them up onto the YouTube channel. And so that's where, uh, and th that's where they, will, uh, they will end up. And you'll see that announcement uh, with my reminder emails that, that come out. And I'm hoping that'll be done in the next week or two uh, for the first uh, uh, four seminars that, that we've had so far. Um, because of the holidays, we're not doing this on the first and third uh, Monday this month. Um, we've moved the third Monday seminar up to the second Monday, which is next week. So we're going to do two seminars one week after the other. I'm very excited also just to make a pitch that I'm hoping you all attend. Um, next week, we're going to hear from Dr. Zach Kohane, um, at, uh, who is an MD PhD at Harvard. Uh, he'll be giving a seminar entitled Finding the Doctor in Biomedical Informatics. And again, I want to make a pitch for this. Zach is very, very well known in the field and is the founder of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the Harvard Medical School. As fa I, my understanding is that's one of the first departments that they've founded in decades. Um, and I, we're very, very lucky to have him presenting. So I'm very excited about that and the other speakers that we have uh, coming up for the rest of the year. We'll be doing this all the way through May, and I we should have an announcement uh, sometime in January for the rest of the year. We're really, really excited about all the speakers that we've got lined up, uh, uh, lined up to present, and next Monday should be great. So for today, um, we have four presenters from the Department of Medicine um, at, uh, at the University of Washington. Very excited about hearing their view on adopting AI into clinical care and the challenges that uh, in that uh, that are available for answering using AI data science and other fa you know, fancy data technologies. Um, our first speaker is going to be Professor Barbara Young, who is the chair of medicine um, and has and joined us in uh, 2019 on September 1st. So very relatively recent as the sixth chair of our Department of Medicine at the University of Washington. Following that will be Dr. Stephen Finn, who will present, um, who is the professor of medicine and, and health services and the head of the Division of General Internal Medicine. And then Graham Nickel uh, is a professor of medicine and an adjunct professor of emergency medicine and the Leonard Cobb Medic One Foundation endowed professor in pre-hospital emergency care. And then Pavan Bhatraju, who is an assistant professor of medicine. Um, and uh, really excited to hear all four of these speakers present. And I'll start by introducing Barbara, who will then kick it off and then they'll do handoffs and share, uh, and share their own screens. Dr. Young received her medical degree in 1996 from Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Sandy Kimmel Cancer Center in San Diego. She also did a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in gastroenterology at UC San Diego 
and eventually accepted a faculty position there in 2004 and then became assistant director for the gastroenterology fellowship program in 2006. She was, has also been a faculty member at Northwestern um, and the University of Illinois at Chicago and then recruited, we recruited here uh, to the University of Washington as chair of medicine. So Barbara, I'm really excited to uh, kick it off uh, and uh, allow you to, 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 to tell us about uh, these presentations. Well, thank you. As Steve is pulling them up, um, you know, I have a couple of um, disclaimers and one is that I really don't do AI but you will see where this is going to lead us. I'm a AI aficionado though, and a learner. And I will say, I want to uh, thank Sean and Dushan and Charlie and everyone else for giving us the opportunity to give a more insight into what are the challenges and the opportunities within medicine. I quickly turn to Steve, who really is sort of spearheading a lot of these activities and very knowledgeable around what's been going on in the department. And we've assembled this team um, of folks who've been pretty in depth immersed already in some of these challenges. So I can't wait for us to share what they've been working on and giving really, we wanted to give an overall overview um, to see what is possible in the medicine realm and even more so what may be on the horizon. And so I will turn it over to Steve and I will introduce Steve here also. Um, of course, you know, the bios are posted. I can't even start to talk about um, all the things Steve has done. Um, he's been a division head for many, many years. I'm not even going to say how long. I think maybe longest sitting. Um, he's really um, such a trusted colleague and sounding board when it comes to cutting edge AI work, which is maybe something that a lot of you folks don't know about him. Um, he served too many roles that I could mention, very prominent national roles, especially during his time at the VA. Um, and he's also been... Um, deputy editor of the JAMA Network Open and has really uh, elevated it to new heights. And I would say a lot of the AI, AI work that's emerging is coming through that mechanism. So he is really the perfect person to kick us off here. So I'm going to hand it over to Steve because there's a lot of data we're going to go over. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and uh, thanks to Duchant and to Sean and the others for inviting us to speak today. Um, so uh, I, we're going to do this in a bit of a tag team. Um, I'm going to uh, review sort of a general approach, a framework for implementing AI into clinical settings. Um, uh, Graham is going to talk about his work uh, in AI guided workflow, uh, particularly in cardiac resuscitation. And uh, Graham is an internationally known and respected uh, researcher in the area of, of cardiac resuscitation. He is perennially a top-sided investigator um, and uh, has written some of the most um, highly cited and um, uh, widespread uh, research in the area of cardiac resuscitation. And uh, that will be uh, followed, Graham will be followed by Pavan uh, Batraju, um, who is uh, a newer member of our faculty um, um, and uh, doesn't share our uh, uh, Graham and my uh, hair, hair tint. Uh, and he's gonna talk about uh, his work in uh, applying AI to uh, managing acute kidney injury. So I'm gonna dive in and uh, just to, um, mention some important terms uh, and uh, make the point that this is the last you'll hear of these terms in my talk. Uh, this is not going to be a terribly technical talk. I, I may um, uh, touch on some technical aspects, but really this is more about um, taking these techniques, uh, which many of you in the audience have used, and actually uh, being able to integrate them uh, into uh, clinical practice. Uh, the framework uh, I'm going to use uh, to discuss this is adapted from um, a recent publication from the National Academy of Medicine 
on uh, AI, and you can download this uh, book for absolute free from the NAM website. Um, and it defines what I would call a virtu virtuous cycle of steps in moving AI into uh, clinical settings. And I just want to start that, you know, we'll start with the first step of identifying clinical needs. It says identify or reassess, and that's because this is a cycle and it has to be, you know, repeatedly followed as uh, AI is um, both introduced and then reassessed. And, you know, much of what we have uh, discussed and is in the literature really starts down here, the development of AI systems. And one of my uh, points is going to be that we really have to start upstream, and, and I'll, I'll discuss that more. But in terms of identifying uh, specific needs, uh, I'm going to refer back to a couple of the seminars we've already had uh, in this uh, series of individuals who have identified uh, clinical uh, targets uh, for uh, application of AI tools. And just to so walk through perhaps some of the thinking uh, that one needs to pursue when uh, selecting a tool. So two that were brought up in earlier discussions were uh, readmissions and sepsis. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit from a medical perspective about why both of these actually represent challenging targets uh, for AI modeling. Uh, they're both very important clinically. Uh, readmissions are uh, a major expense for hospitals and have been identified by Medicare and you know, insurers as a major expense uh, in the hospital, um, you know, in, in medical expenditures in this country. And for that reason, there are performance metrics and all sorts of activities to try and reduce readmissions. Um, but there are some problems with identifying it as a target for AI. Uh, in trying to predict patients who are um, at highest risk for readmission, it's important to note that even if you can identify them, only a quarter or less of those, individ in, of those individuals you know, are admitted for reasons that are avoidable. So that, um, you know, that represents a problem there. Um, the most common cause of readmission uh, you know, uh, is the most common patients who are readmitted are those with heart failure. Uh, they account for about a third of readmissions, and usually these are associated with 30-day readmissions, uh, unplanned. And 25% and of patients with heart failure will be readmitted, um, but two-thirds of them for a completely different problem. Um, now, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of prediction models for 30-day readmissions, um, and most of them have fairly modest uh, AUCs of the neighborhood of 0.6 to 0.7. And actually recent um, uh, studies have suggested that actually uh, machine learning, more modern techniques, do not actually uh, improve on more standard older techniques such as a logistic regression. And, and perhaps we can talk about um, why ML may not be advancing in this area. But again, this just raises the question of thinking about and I'll talk more about this, uh, selecting you know, a target for prediction in this case um, and selecting methods that might be best suited. And, and one of the real issues here is that I think it's really important to identify what happens with the prediction. So let's say we can, and this, these are predictions of patients with heart failure um, and what interventions have actually been demonstrated to reduce readmissions. Um, and you may say, how is this related to AI? But if we're making the prediction, we want to pair that with an intervention that is likely to have clinical benefit for patients. Um, and you can see here uh, interventions that have been uh, tested in randomized control trials uh, from clinics, nurse home visits, et cetera. And you can see really only three of these have been shown to have a beneficial effect in terms of reducing um, the risk of readmission. And uh, only one really that's got a sizable um, 
um, uh, effect here, uh, which are ho nurse home visits. So my argument would be, okay, if we're gonna try and predict, even given all the difficulties that I have uh, raised with predicting readmissions, uh, that prediction really needs to be paired to a resource um, that we have that, you know, the, that clinicians could um, act on, on that prediction. Uh, sepsis is a, another one. Um, and, and we were reminded in a previous uh, seminar that EPIC, which is our, um, going to be our new inpatient um, uh, record uh, EHR here shortly, um, comes with uh, an, a number of um, embedded um, uh, prediction models that, that can be turned on. There is one for readmission. There's also one for sepsis. Um, but again, I'm going to make the point sepsis is a challenging target for uh, AI um, prediction. One is it's not actually even a disease. It's a syndrome. Um, and there's a lot of controversy really about the uh, definition of what sepsis is. There are a number of uh, competing criteria, SIRS-SOFA, QSOFA, there's actually many others. Um, and so there's not um, a, a consensus about what sepsis is. Um, and only about 12% of sepsis deaths are considered on careful review by clinicians to have been uh, possibly to definitely preventable. So even when you can identify sepsis, again, it's not clear um, that you can prevent death from sepsis. And in fact, uh, as of the current time, no well-designed prospective study has completely conclusively shown that there are outcome benefits to interventions. And, and as is the case with many predictions, and, and sepsis is particularly uh, sensitive is the timing of that prediction. So you can see here that um, as the hours um, before the, the event um, become uh, greater, um, the AUCs um, for the prediction models go down substantially. So it's relatively easy to predict right beforehand, but as you want to sort of get uh, a heads up and uh, have more of a, um, you know, latency here, uh, the predictions are much less uh, accurate. So that, again, um, these are important topics worthy of, uh, you know, attention and, um, uh, but with their own challenges. So that, you know, as, as we work on identifying uh, the targets, um, I think a lot of thought has to go into um, what those targets should be. And, and decisions shouldn't simply be, well, we've got this um, tool in Epic and we should flip the switch and, and turn it on. Um, the next um, issue is really describing workflows. And, and I really can't emphasize this enough. And I'll come back to this uh, after you've heard from um, Graham and Pavan to talk a little bit more about uh, defining uh, the importance of defining workflows. But essentially, if we make a prediction, we've got to identify who is going to uh, receive that prediction, uh, how they're going to fit that into their workflow. Will that prediction be delivered at a time when uh, they can attend to it, act on it, and, and will it be viewed as constructive? So I'm going to use uh, an example from some of my own work here. Uh, to talk about, um, I think, some of the challenges here. So um, as you can see now, nearly a decade ago, um, we developed a model uh, in VA uh, to predict hospitalization, death, or the conjoint probability with reasonably good um, C statistics, as you can see. And, and here are the calibration curves, which show you know, very high um, uh, likelihoods of people at the highest risk. And, and we converted um, these into percentile rankings called a care assessment need score. Um, and um, we actually uh, implemented this in the VA uh, around uh, 2012. And what do I mean by implemented it? Well, we actually, uh, you know, again, this was pre 
uh, exists as was before widely wide availability of our current uh, ML tools. This was done with uh, polytomous regression. And actually we'd run this model and it still is done up to this day uh, on all VA enrollees uh, in, in primary care uh, every week. Um, that's about 6 million people. And those results are then populated into a report that's available through uh, the electronic health record and uh, by uh, provider, as you can see here. And, and the report that uh, is distributed actually list patient in descending order of the probability of these events or their percentile score of this care assessment need score. I've uh, blotted out the, the names and social security numbers, obviously on a, this old report from my own clinic when I was practicing in the VA. And um, you can see, not only does it give the probability of that event, but you know, blowing up um, this uh, banner up here, it also provides uh, information on the most recent um, uh, whether the patient's enrolled in telehealth, whether they're in palliative care, uh, when their last palliative care visit, home care, last home care, emergency room, hospital discharges, primary care, uh, and when it last happened. And uh, a provider can look at this for all, uh, all of their patients. And, and the question is, you know, again, uh, is, did the providers find this useful? Um, this is a survey of uh, users of, of the CAN report, which we recently published. And you can see that the majority of providers uh, basically said uh, they use the report uh, regularly, uh, it's easy to use, they find it helpful, they're confident in their abilities. And, um, you know, again, one would think, well, this is great, right? You got a very accurate model. Uh, providers are using it, they think it's great, um, but, and here's the but. Um, if we look at, you know, how often it's used, and in this uh, histogram, these are hits, and these are people, so individual users by month, uh, over a couple years, uh, over, over a year, excuse me, and you can see it sounds great, you know, a thousand users every month, thousands of hits, um, but the problem is that there are 8,000 primary care providers in the VA. So only about 12 to 15% of the providers were actually accessing the reports. Um, now there were other means by which they could have accessed them that we couldn't uh, track, but uh, even so, um, it was a minority of providers who were using this report. And this report is again, sent to every um, provider in the VA um, every week. Um, and um, you can see that there was great, these are the regions of the VA. In some regions, use was, usage was very high, some regions very low. Uh, and that had to do with, uh, to a good uh, extent, how much leadership were encouraging use. So that, you know, again, um, the question is, as we get here, um, you know, this wasn't fitting when we talked to providers, wasn't really fitting well into their workflows. They weren't actually sure what to do with it. Now, we had actually thought we'd identified the target, the target state for this. So this just basically shows um, uh, usage of, these are the CAN scores here, uh, the percentiles from zero to 100 here for both of these. Um, this is for uh, telehealth, and you can see what this basically shows as the risk of events, hospitalization, death rose, the enrollment in um, telehealth rose, that's good. Um, the enrollment in home care rose, that's good, right? Um, but if we look, actually look at the denominators here and ask of patients in the highest risk categories, this is patients with over a 95% chance of having one of these events, the top uh, five percentiles, we can see only 20% were enrolled in telehealth, 80% um, were not. Uh, similarly, for home care, um, only 7% were enrolled of these highest risk patients, 93% weren't. And if we look at palliative care, only 2% of the highest risk patients and hospice well under 1%. So that was, we tried to envision what the 
the, the target state would be, would be to in, increase these services. Um, that was really what the goal was here. And, and there's a limited amount of evaluation here. Here's one that was recently published. I, I wasn't part of this, uh, in which they looked at uh, these five and a half million patients um, and found out that only 100,000 or so uh, at any given time uh, when they looked had a goals of care discussion actually documented out of, you know, and, and 5.5 million did not. Um, now, when their scores on this were high, they were much more likely to have had these conversations. But again, I hearken back to the, you know, the very limited input that we had and, you know, with a, a huge amount of work um, to integrate uh, these prediction models into clinical care. So I argue that you've got to do all this homework first before you even get to the development or acquisition of an AI system. And I won't go through this uh, checklist. I think Sean, Deschamps, and uh, others who have spoken quite eloquently, in my view, to, to this group have really detailed um, um, you know, many of uh, these um, issues that need to be addressed. And, and I have actually been impressed uh, that UW uh, has been moving well in, in, the, in these directions of developing uh, the resources um, and the, that are necessary, I believe, um, to, um, to safely and effectively uh, integrate um, uh, AI into the clinical env environment. I will, you know, once again, argue that I think governance is key here. Uh, it's got to be explicit, it's got to be organized, and it's got to have, you know, a, a way to examine and uh, evaluate uh, these, uh, these issues. And um, I, I, I'm assuming our slides will be made available and um, that, excuse me here, um, you know, you can at some other date look at these in more uh, detail. Sorry, I'm flipping through here. Don't mean to. I, I would like to spend a moment though talking about the statistical and methodologic considerations. Um, we all focus on accuracy uh, and you read the papers where they say our AUC is 0.88, um, great model. Um, I, I would caution again, um, using AUC as a sole um, criterion for the accuracy of a model. As you can see, I've listed lots of other competing and complementary uh, metrics that people have used, uh, the area under the free RUC curve, confusion matrices, accuracy, uh, I would argue positive predictive value and precision are important, of course, in, in the uh, prediction world, of course, that's uh, recall and sensitivity. Uh, as well, uh, precision recall curves, specificity, negative predictive value, F1 scores, numbers needed to screen, likelihood ratios, net reclassification indices. Um, and actually my favorites are, you know, would be stratification tables and calibration curves, but there's really no one way we can, you know, agree necessarily uh, that a, a model reaches a, at, at least at this point in time, reaches a certain uh, acceptable level of performance. I also want to sort of emphasize the notion of validation. And I think Sean, in, in his talk a, a few weeks ago, I thought did a, a great uh, job of explaining why validation is needed and developing, you know, other systems, uh, independent validations, which I think really should become a, a standard. And I would strongly uh, support that. Once they're implemented, these models actually they there's drift, things change, data change, patients change, so they require ongoing maintenance and recalibration. And I won't spend a lot of time, but I think increasingly uh, we're becoming aware of bias in these models, particularly for patients on whom we have limited data. One of my favorite examples is no shows in clinic. Epic has a model for no shows. But you know, uh, the patients who don't show up typically don't show up for a reason. They don't have resources, they don't have transportation, they're sick, et cetera. And so as we 
build those biases into our model, actually. Um, it's been increasingly shown that we're uh, developing self um, perpetuating predictions. Um, I just want to give a, an example. This is from a paper that is in press. And so I'm unable to cite it because it's uh, being embargoed. But I, I did uh, get the permission of the authors to present it. It's, it's not from our institution. It's from a well-respected East Coast uh, institution. Um, and uh, they developed what I think is a really uh, technically nice model that uses uh, inpatient data in real time, actually, um, to predict hypoglycemia for inpatients. Um, and it reports back into uh, uh, a companion to the EHR. You can see the C statistics here are excellent. Um, and um, they've um, you know, validated not only in the first uh, institution, but in four other uh, hospitals. Uh, it's got good sensitivity and specificity. But again, if you look at the predictive values here, um, they're actually quite low. Um, and what this means is that for every 10 patients who, for whom a provider would get an alert that there's a risk of hypoglycemia, only one of them uh, will actually have the event if it's not, um, you know, uh, prevented in any way. Um, and, you know, clinicians, uh, you know, when 90% of the alerts are negative over time, are very likely um, to tune those out and, and view it as um, you know, noise. Um, there are a variety of other issues I'm not gonna go into here, um, and, uh, but I, I think are very important. Um, and again, you know, now we're gonna talk about finally getting this into um, the, uh, the, the health system. And um, you know, I think Many of us would take a learning health system approach um, that this is something we do, we study, and we um, use our data systems to understand. Um, and part of that, and I think this is really important, is to monitor the ongoing performance of these. You just can't turn them on. Um, I, I personally believe that's irresponsible and, and perhaps even unethical. You gotta collect data. And, and the nice thing about modern IT is that most of this can be hardwired in. The idea of turning this on and going back retrospectively to try and figure out if it had an effect really, I think, is difficult to justify. And I just present here the kinds of data um, that one should think about um, accessing. So uh, how often are these uh, AI tools accessed? Uh, how often are the recommendations accepted or overridden? Uh, what are the API calls? Are there privacy changes? Um, can we measure clinical safety and benefit? Uh, do the users report issues and, and disagree with the recommendations? And to you know, compare model performance against historical uh, data. And there are lots of other things. And before I you know, go on to introduce my, or to turn it over to my colleagues here, I just, many of you are probably familiar with the Gartner uh, hype cycles. This is the one for AI for 2020. And you can see that a lot of these AI applications we're talking about here are you know, either on the um, ascending limb or the peak of what they call inflated expectations. Um, and that, you know, GPU accelerators, which, you know, are, in my view, driving a lot of this um, technology, you know, are way over here, but the, the, the applications have not caught up with, with the, um, the technology here. So um, I'm going to stop here and turn this over to Graham Nickel, um, uh, who's going to talk about uh, AI to improve resuscitation. Thanks, Steve. So I, now I will discuss ongoing work by my colleagues and I to incorporate artificial intelligence into resuscitation care to improve patient outcomes. These are my disclosures of industry relationships. Next, please. Patients can develop a need for resuscitation in the out-of-hospital, emergency department, or hospital setting. 
Our work could apply to a variety of disorders mediated by changes in blood flow, including heart attack, which is loss of blood flow in, to part of the heart muscle, stroke, which is loss of blood flow to part of the brain, or shock, which is reduced blood flow to some organs and tissues. But at present, we're focused on cardiac arrest, which is loss of effective pumping of the heart that results in reduced blood flow throughout the body. Next. This figure illustrates an evidence-based algorithm for how to care for patients who have had blood flow restored at or after at a hospital cardiac arrest. Note that experts recommend managing hemodynamics and oxygenation to achieve specific physiologic targets, which are associated with better outcomes. Next. Timely and accurate measurement of hemodynamics and oxygenation, as well as initiation of therapeutic responses to improve these values, are critical to achieving optimal patient outcome, but both are difficult to achieve at present. Next. Multiple methods of measuring hemodynamics and oxygenation are available. Continuous accurate measurement of blood pressure generally requires placement of a line into a small artery for direct measurement, but few patients have an arterial line available during or after resuscitation. As well, cardiac output is more strongly associated with outcome than blood pressure, but again, continuous accurate measurement of cardiac output requires placement of a line into a large blood vessel. As well, oxygen is most accurately measured by periodically drawing a sample directly from the blood, but this is not always feasible. So in summary, current tools to continuously measure cardiac output or oxygenation are, are either not simple nor accurate. Next. My collaborators and I have developed a simple, non-invasive, non-novel method of continuous measurement of cardiac output using artificial intelligence. These novel measure, measures are highly correlated with traditional invasive measures of cardiac output, as shown by these graphs. A high correlation is observed between cardiac output measured invasively with thermodilution on the x-axis of the graph on the left, with cardiac output measured non-invasively using our novel uh, measure on the y-axis. As well, a high correlation is observed over time in the graph on the right, where on the x-axis we have change in cardiac output measured by thermal dilution over time, and on the y-axis we have change in cardiac output with our novel measure over time. We're developing a similar simple, novel, non-invasive, accurate measure of continuous uh, measures of tissue oxygenation using artificial intelligence. Next, please. Clinicians who try to improve outcomes during and after resuscitation are supposed to follow the evidence-based algorithm like pilots following a map to find treasure. In medicine, the treasure is a good patient outcome, but we cannot get there if we cannot accurately measure the inputs. To, as well, to paraphrase the character Elizabeth in Pirates of the Caribbean, where pirates hang the code and hang the rules, they're more like guidelines anyway. This is to say that clinicians have a low rate of compliance or adherence to evidence-based algorithms as Steve showed you with his data. So our long-term goal is to apply predictive analytics to our novel methods of continuous non-invasive measurements of cardiac output and tissue oxygenation so as to predict patient response to specific interventions to improve hemodynamics and oxygenation and recommend these interventions in real time to clinicians. And I will now pass this uh, the, the baton over to Pavan. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Steve, as well as Barbara for the invitation to speak. So um, the title of my part is uh, Phenotyping Acute Kidney Injury to Identify Therapeutics. Uh, next, please. So acute kidney injury is common, especially in hospitalized patients. It's a sudden decrease in kidney function that um, currently we diagnose by a rise in a blood biomarker called serum creatinine or a drop in urine output. Um, there's threefold reasons why potentially um, AKI can be problematic in the hospital setting. First, a lot of the essential medications and sedatives that we give in the intensive care unit are cleared by the kidneys, such as antibiotics. Also, um, the kidneys regulate homeostasis by electrolytes and then um, ICU patients particularly may receive large volumes of fluid resuscitation as well as medications 
And so with a dropping kidney function, you could have issues of volume overload, uh, pulmonary edema, and potentially even leading to respiratory failure and invasive mechanical ventilation. One of the challenges, particularly with AKI, is that um, we use serum creatinine to diagnose AKI, but it's a very heterogeneous population with different causes from sepsis to cardiac ischemia to other causes with also different pathophysiologic processes. And then uh, next, please. I think the fundamental problem is combining this heterogeneous clinical AKI population. It limits the identification of subgroups that potentially may respond differently to therapeutics. Uh, next, please. So to go about identifying subgroups within AKI, we undertook a study looking at um, subphenotyping AKI. And so we had a discovery population of patients that were enrolled prospectively at the University of Washington by uh, Mark Werfel. And then we had a validation cohort of patients collected from multiple institutions around the US. And so there's um, 800 patients in the discovery population, 450 in the validation. And all patients had acute kidney injury at the time of study enrollment, and they had blood collected within 24 hours of study enrollment. And so in the plasma that was collected, we measured 29 different clinical as well as uh, novel laboratory biomarkers that are involved in the pathogenesis of AKI. So these were a priori features that we chose, including markers of endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, as well as apoptosis. And then next, please. And so when we applied latent class analysis, we found that we identified two subgroups of patients with AKI. We termed these subgroups AKI subphenotype 1, as well as AKI subphenotype 2. We found that approximately 60% of patients fell into subphenotype 1, and 40% fell into subphenotype 2. Remarkably, when we, did, um, when we applied our clustering algorithm to the discovery and the validation population, we found a similar set of two populations. Uh, next, please. So then the next question we had was, how can we move this to the clinical setting? It's challenging for a clinician to have to measure 30 different variables for each patient to identify which subphenotype they potentially would fall in. And so working with Leela Zelnick, um, a biostatistician, biostatistician at the Kidney Research Institute, we applied um, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, a machine learning algorithm to um, identify a parsimonious model that potentially would identify subphenotype membership. Uh, we found that a three biomarker model, so biomarkers involved in endothelial function, um, the ratio of angiopoin 2 over angiopoin 1, as well as a circulating biomarker involved in inflammation, soluble tumor necrosis factor receptor 1. This three biomarker model had fairly good area under the curve or C statistic in our training set, our internal test, as well as our external validation set. Um, next, please. Ne next, we wanted to see, now with this prediction model, do patients with different subphenotype classification potentially respond differently to therapeutics? And one of the therapeutics that we've been potentially excited about is looking at a vasopressor. So this is in patients who present with shock in the intensive care unit, giving a medicine um, vasopressin, which potentially can increase uh, patient's blood pressure. There's been preclinical data as well as, as well as early phase clinical trial data that finds that vasopressin um, improves kidney specific outcomes and kidney recovery. And so then we worked with Jim Russell as well as Keith Wally and others at University of British Columbia to do a reanalysis of the vasopressin versus norepinephrine infusion in patient with septic shock. So this was the VAST study. It was published in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, in the primary paper, they enrolled 800 patients with septic shock. Um, they randomized them to either receiving norepinephrine as their primary vasopressor or receiving the early addition of vasopressin with norepinephrine. Um, as you can see in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right there, the primary outcome was 90-day mortality. And you can see that um, there is no significant difference between the vasopressin group versus the norepinephrine group. Uh, next, please. So then um, we randomly chose 300, approximately 300 patients with plasma collected prior to randomization. In those, 271 had acute kidney injury prior to randomization in this clinical trial. 
We then uh, measured the three biomarker model, angiopoines, as well as TNFR1. And we found that uh, 113 patients fell into this subphenotype 1 and 148 in subphenotype 2. And then the main results are on the right here with the forest plot. So when we looked at 90-day mortality, as you can see, all patients with AKI is the second row there. Um, the second column are patients who received norepinephrine therapy, and the third column are patients who received norepinephrine with vasopressin. So if you look at all patients with acute kidney injury, there is no statistically significant difference between 90-day mortality. However, if you stratify patients based on their AKI subphenotype, interestingly, you see that AKI subphenotype 1, there is a significant mortality benefit with vasopressin therapy. Um, this was even after adjusting for Apache 2 or severity of um, ICU severity of illness at um, randomization, as well as norepinephrine dose. In contrast, AKI subphenotype 2 had no significant difference in mortality with the early addition of vasopressin. And so um, since this, there was a group in the Netherlands who uh, independently validated our work and found that um, these two subphenotypes are identified in patients with AKI. And I think it shows that potentially we can identify disease-specific subgroups that may respond differently to therapeutics. And if we lump all patients together in large uh, heterogeneous clinical trials, we may be missing a potential signal. All right, thank you, Steve. I'll give it back to you. Thanks, Pavan. And, and I, I think uh, those, both uh, Pavan's and Graham's uh, presentations were nicely illustrative of the importance of when a prediction is being made to have really a goal in mind and a target for what exactly um, uh, we, we want. Now, uh, what, what action might be taken. So I'm going to talk for just to close out here a little bit about sort of what I think are some of the research challenges. Um, and, and my goal here will be to um, perhaps stimulate um, the UW and other communities that are here to think about some of these problems, because I, I don't think we're going to get um, uh, clinical uptake to some great extent until we solve them. And what we're doing now, I would argue, with um, prediction, and, and I'm going to focus on prediction here. I think, you know, in terms of image processing, um, you know, the technology is moving ahead and integration into uh, clinical settings is happening. And, and, and Deshant uh, Sahani gave a lovely talk a couple of weeks ago about workflow management in radiology, where I think you can see the progress. Uh, but on, on a more clinical patient side, uh, progress is, is much slower. Um, and um, particularly in the area of taking these predictions and, and putting them to work. So I, I liken what we're doing now uh, with prediction is much like this. If we think about using machine learning to predict car accidents. So you get in your car and your car tells you how likely you are to crash uh, while you're driving to work. Uh, is that what we want? Or do we want this? Do we want the system to be uh, with us uh, in real time, uh, identifying the risks and guiding uh, our actions uh, in real time? And I, I think we'd all agree, um, this is what we need. Um, and, and what are the challenges to getting there? Well, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, I said we have to analyze clinical workflow, but the fact of the matter is we do not actually currently possess what I believe are the tools to do that. Um, if we look for industry uh, analogs, uh, manufacturing and other parts where, you know, AI is uh, used widely, um, there are actually specific languages which are used to uh, control robots, to control um, systems. Um, and there are lots of them. Um, you may be familiar with them, BPNM, MN, uh, which is business process modeling and notation language, YAL, yet another workflow language, uh, XPDL, which is XML um, uh, process development language, BPEL, 
uh, business process, uh, execution language. They're, they're all these languages. And unfortunately, it turns out that they don't port well uh, to clinical environments. And there have been uh, efforts to create uh, clinical uh, terminologies and languages, uh, but it's not to date. Um, there aren't good examples. And the problem is, is that clinical processes, as we well know, are uh, complex. And as Graham showed out, uh, as, as, as pointed out, um, uh, clinicians uh, tend to be uh, uh, a little bit idiosyncratic. Um, and, you know, we can have, rather than sort of nice linear timed processes, um, many individuals can uh, participate in one process as we do with teams. A uh, task may be assigned to one person or to another person. Uh, it can optionally, you know, involve other roles. And there are often multiple time contingencies. In, in business processes, you get you know, a lot of certain amount of time for something to happen. If it doesn't happen, you take an action. In clinical medicine, there are lots of contingencies. Uh, you know, you need to get certain test results before you can refer a patient. You need to have certain data before you can make a decision. So it is a very complicated problem. And, and before actually it can even be um, uh, uh, prescriptive, it's gotta be descriptive. And, and Graham showed you uh, a, a, um, a workflow algorithm for resuscitation. This is one for ischemic heart disease. And these are, in some ways, idealized uh, workflows, um, these clinical algorithms, the way that things should happen. Uh, they're shorthand. They're missing many steps. Uh, they don't acknowledge that certain things exist in certain environments and don't exist in other environments and don't take into account all the operational steps that, need, that each one of these lines uh, sort of oversimplifies and jumps forward. So it becomes very difficult to take a Visio diagram and turn it into uh, a clinical workflow. And, and I'd argue until we can describe our workflows, it's gonna be very hard to understand how they can be manipulated, uh, particularly with AI tools. And some of the challenges here will be um, achieving uh, context or situational awareness. In other words, the system has to understand uh, who the patient is, what their clinical characteristics are, including their preferences, um, and what the provider role is and their expertise, what best practices are, and sort of be able to, at a certain point in time, understand what the decision uh, at hand is, and to be able to insert uh, into workflow you know, the right information at the decision-making time, time when uh, a provider can actually evaluate it and uh, act on it. Um, and, and that's a very uh, challenging and, and complicated, um, I, I think, act, you know, uh, goal, um, but one that is going to be necessary, in my view, before we get uh, to really being able to implement uh, AI into um, clinical context. Risk prioritization will be a big part of that. What do I mean? Well, there are innumerable targets, right? There are thousands, if not tens of thousands of various risk indexes. And you and background the uh, system could be constantly evaluating and projecting out into the system, those which are most relevant, uh, those for which a patient has the highest risk and for which there is a, uh, an intervention that can reduce that risk. Um, you know, that sort of will be, you know, what I envision over time. Um, right now, we've just got a bunch of models. And also, I think equally important will be uh, a clear understanding of the human factor. Uh, we have overloaded our uh, healthcare providers with information. Um, um, they, and I'll include myself in this group, are often quite resistant uh, to getting new information just because we're having great difficulty both locating uh, and processing the information for which we're already responsible. And we've got to have research that informs how to effectively uh, provide information um, 
in a way that meets with the preferences uh, of, of the target. And as I started with in this talk, links to specific actions uh, which uh, have benefit. Um, we've made, I think, a tacit assumption that this all should be done through the EHR. And I think we actually even have to step back and ask the question, is our modern EHR even the right platform for this? And I ask this as a question. I don't know the answer, but it is a question that needs to be asked. And I uh, you know, cite the article in the New Yorker by Atul Gawande, uh, in which you know, he makes the point that um, EHRs have not um, delivered on their promise. Uh, IT, the goal of IT is to improve work, to make it easier, to make it better. And I think it's hard to argue that the HRs have made it easier. Uh, and I, I agree that it's made it better in many ways, but uh, in other ways, uh, not so much. And so I, I think part of, you know, of the AI move will be re-envisioning actually what, what, what the IT platform looks like. Um, and, and I'm gonna close and just say, um, I, I've been at this for a while. You know, I cited a study from 10 years ago. I, I'm going to cite my own work here again, just to sort of um, uh, show that I've earned my gray hair here. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial of a stochastic model uh, for managing patients on anticoagulation uh, that was published in 94, begun actually in the late 80s using ancient uh, technology, laptops in a clinic. Uh, multi-center randomized control trial. Um, it was unfortunately negative. Um, here's another one, uh, more recent, you can see from about 15 years ago, so started uh, two decades ago, uh, of using computer-based suggestions for managing uh, heart failure. And again, uh, both of these trials failed because the uh, targets, the providers, uh, didn't use uh, the recommendations. Actually, we showed retrospectively that the recommendations were correct, but the providers didn't accept them. Um, and again, you know, the human interface piece is huge. And, and I'd argue that we desperately need uh, controlled evaluations of, of AI tools. Um, uh, and uh, RCTs and, and other, uh, tech, other uh, study methodologies are, are really necessary. And I, I'm are gonna argue we can actually build these into our systems. We can create platforms to do this, just as you know, many of uh, the large IT platforms, be it, you know, as we know, Google, Amazon, you know, build those evaluations actually into the guts uh, of their IT systems. And they're always evaluating. And I think going back to the notion of a learning health system, that's really where we should be. So I'm gonna close and argue, perhaps what we don't need right now are any more prediction models. What we do need is to tackle uh, these really challenging problems um, so that these models and, and their successors uh, can uh, make um, substantial benefits uh, in, in the clinical um, arena. So just to sum up, um, I, I think I've tried to argue that technical advances in AI are outpacing uh, practical applications, uh, particularly in the areas of predictive analytics, decision support, and clinical workflow management. Um, uh, the adoption of AI into clinical settings really entails consideration of multiple issues, much more than just model creation. Uh, it requires strong governance and ongoing evaluation I think there are opportunities in clinical settings to create evaluation platforms, and I'd love to see UW uh, take a leadership role there. And, and really, my view, the greatest obstacle at present is workflow integration. Um, and there's enormous research opportunities there. So I again want to thank Sean and Duchamp and my co-presenters. It's been a pleasure. I think we've left a half an hour for discussion. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, thanks very much. So I'm going to stop sharing screen here, if that's OK, Sean. Great. Thank you so much. And thank all of 
the presenter. So I, I will clap, but you'll have to imagine what it sounds like with everybody clapping on mute. <laughs> um, so as we move into questions, there have been a couple of questions that have been put into chat, and I will give the speakers the opportunity, the, the question askers, to give the opportunity to um, uh, to just to restate their question that they've put in. We have a user, Harefield. Do you want to ask your question directly? If if not, I can read it. You'll have to come off of mute to do that, though. Hello. Hi. Hi. Go ahead and ask your question. Thanks for an incredibly rich, stimulating presentation. So many ideas swirling around. So I'm just going to read my question. How will medical students and other clinical providers receive perspectives, controversies, and training to prepare them for the eventual maturation of AI in clinical care when they're in professional school, during their residency at the bedside? And the second question is, will the use of AI in clinical care require especially certification in order for its use to be valid and trusted? Holy cow, where to start? Um, I'll start and ask my um, colleagues here to chime in. Um, those are great questions and, and hard ones. Um, uh, you know, I, I do think that, you know, we do need to train uh, students and, and all healthcare providers. This is going to be ubiquitous. This is not doctors. This is everywhere. Um, uh, they may actually be better suited to it than some of us older people, you know, because they're used to it. They're, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the, the generation of physicians that I was doing trials with, you know, uh, stopped looking at uh, these AI or at uh, computer recommendations if they thought they were wrong. I think this new generation actually understands what they are. It's like Amazon recommending a book or Netflix recommending a, a movie. It doesn't have the weight of a, you must do this. It's a source of information using probabilistic and other data uh, to help inform a decision that you might make. Um, and I say, so part of it will be understanding the technology and part of it will be attitudinal and getting back to the human factors and understanding about, you know, how people use that information. Um, I think a big issue that is swirling these days is uh, transparency. Um, most of these, uh, you know, prediction models currently are not at all transparent. And some of the technologies which are used are fundamentally unable to be transparent. Um, uh, some of the ML ones, they can't give you, you know, they can't explain why uh, this is being recommended or, or what basis. And I think increasingly, particularly as we understand the biases in these models, there's going to be an expectation for some level of, of transparency. Um, but um, I think, you know, you're asking questions that need research about how to train people, how to use them, uh, how to understand how people use them. Um, I think these are uh, fascinating uh, questions. And, um, you know, will it require uh, subspecialty validation, um, certification? Um, I don't think so any more than prescribing drugs are, but I think it will require the recognition that these are potent. You know, you're recommending, you know, uh, or a machine is recommending sometimes that an action be taken. Um, that can have clinical consequences for a patient. There are issues with ethics in terms of uh, consent. There are issues with, you know, uh, accuracy. And much of these now are currently coming under the regulation of FDA um, and, and other organizations, which actually, and we've discussed this in prior seminars, are um, uh, you know, having regulatory um, structures that will deal with this. But um, I've only scratched the surface on your questions. Let me, let me um, hand it off to uh, uh, one of my uh, co-presenters to see if they have anything to add. 
Uh, it's Graham. I, I think transparency is important. Um, I think ongoing evaluation is important to make sure that any of these technologies as they're introduced do not have uh, unintended consequences uh, and do not do things like reinforce our past problems with, with uh, inequities. Um, uh, specifically in terms of uh, FDA, they do they have introduced a, a an approach or a guidance document on how they propose to evaluate these software based solutions. I think a challenge uh, to go back to transparency is I don't think we necessarily understand when we are using something that is based on artificial intelligence or or machine learning or, or however you care to frame it. So I, I don't think physicians will be restricted from using these. I don't think they can be restricted from using these uh, unless and until they have specialty certification. Pavan or, or Barbara? I, I may chime in again from a more big picture standpoint that I think what was lined out in this talk is exactly this tension that I think adopting it into clinical care will need all these considerations yet we don't have the transparency necessarily and we don't have the data to know how to go about in training and integrating. Yes, the train, but yet the train is leaving the station. So I think that's exactly the tension. I think that's why we're making a plea of like, if you adopt this in clinical care, these are all the consideration and then some, but of course we don't only wanna be at the table. We wanna be leading some of these efforts because we feel as a school of medicine we really know what the problems are and what the opportunities are. So I think all these um, are so timely. Um, that's why I'm so happy, as, as Steve was saying, to be part of this initiative where we can move this forward and have exactly this kind of dialogue around these, around these issues. And we need to have these dialogues now and really start researching, getting the data and implementing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would just like to echo what everyone said, but the one piece with um, students and thinking about teaching this in medical school, I think one of the challenges is, you know, when I was in medical school and residency, we mostly focused on randomized control trials and understanding that data. And now with more and more complex um, machine learning papers and AI, I think we really need to force ourselves to try to show how approachable this is and how um, students can understand these techniques and how some of the basic concepts of epidemiology still take are important in appraising them. Sean, Sean had an interesting point, which I think relates to this question. Oh yeah, I, it does actually. I was gonna add to this and that, that, you know, a challenge is that simple changes in electronic health record systems or anything that's generating data will affect AI methods. And that's something that often like in a regulatory sense, I don't, I, I might be wrong, but I don't know if we really consider that as much as we should when we consider, you know, an accuracy of an AI method. And I, I don't usually think about, you know, how software changes, like say if Epic makes a change or Cerner or whoever that could have, you know, huge implications on, you know, machine learning methods that are built that drive off of that data that they're producing. Sean, so it, it, it's even as insidious as changing a variable name. So if, if uh, a, uh, one of your uh, covariates in a model happens to be a lab test and the laboratory gets a different assay and changes the name of that or changes the, suddenly your whole model, you know, so uh, actually that model that I showed that we use in the VA uh, once a year, we would run um, predictions of prior year against current year and, and make sure those calibrations remain the same and adjust the model. You could argue maybe a year is not frequent enough, but there's a lot of maintenance and upkeep to these. And I agree that when you turn them on, you've got to, you, you take on that responsibility for monitoring it and, and maintaining it. Agree completely. Sean, if I can make a comment, uh, you know, this was great discussion and thank you, uh, uh, Barbara, Steve, Graham and Pawan for what an amazing focused discussion. 
Uh, my, my question is, <clears throat> one, first, I agree with the overarching theme that we need to solve bigger problem using AI. That's indeed, and the cost equation will come through the solving those problems. I think uh, it will be a downstream effect of solving these problem. We will see value where we can see the cost equation. The question I have is more for, for Barbara as a chair of a very big department, highly impactful department, where there are so many clinical services you cover. Uh, how do your faculty see AI? Is it something they are excited, they, are, they fear, or they are looking forward to getting more AI tools? Uh, can you just uh, enlighten us on that? Well, I can't speak for all. I will have some members of the department speak up too, but I would say all of the above. And I think, as Steve pointed out, the overall data, especially when it comes to inpatient well, and outpatient work, is just the enormity of the ongoing EMR management that has left people a lot less excited. And I think, you know, even some of the data we were getting from D1 of all the things you can do and all these, you know, you can check and you can check the provider and there's all kinds of tools. But at the very end, Todd said, it doesn't reduce workload. And I think that's something that we need to circle back to because we need to think of this as, of course, you know, patient centric, you know, I think in the chat it came up to it has to have value. Um, there have to be reasons we do that but we need to think of the providers also, and we need to use this technology to make life easier for them. And I think until we can clearly show this, I think there's gonna be some apprehension uh, around anything that comes down that is an addition to what people already do. Now, yeah. outside of that box, I think people are very excited because like you said, they see, especially in Seattle, they see all the things that are happening. And I think there's some questions too around why aren't we doing more? Why are we not starting to do all these different things with you know, device monitoring and reading at home? We just have this big telehealth push. So I think, I think there's all these things and the onus is on us to have it be provider and patient centric, to clearly communicate, to be focused, which again, I think this is the initiative that we need where we need to come together and raise those. I will turn it over to Steve Pavan and Graham to, to com comment on this um, in terms of how do providers feel if I left anything out and how do you feel? I actually don't have a basis for answering that. I, I, I think it's one of those uh, issues um, that, you know, in principle, we all sort of think it's a great idea, um, but in practice, I think, you know, people still have uh, reservations. And um, I mean, there's a larger right landscape of AI. And I, I think for many of us, it isn't just within our professional domains. It's, it's now, you know, uh, you know, inveigled in every aspect of our lives. And I think people are asking sensible questions. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I defer to Graham and to Pavan about sort of what providers are thinking. I, I'm, I'm not actually sure. I think it's heterogeneous. Pavan? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. And I, and, and I think you've said this already, Deshaun, but it's, it's a little bit about how can it improve care and how can we directly see it? And then there's, I think there's always this skepticism about what's happening under the hood. When someone says this new AI algorithm does this, I think, I don't know, most clinicians will be like, well, why is that the case? And how am I going to use that to tell a patient to do a certain thing if I don't really understand why that's saying that? And so that's a challenge. And, I, and we've talked about this, how to make these interpretable models you know, I will also make, there is a uh, comment from if anyone in the group wants to take from Mark Phillips, but in the meantime, I just want to make another comment is how interconnected we all are. So if medicine does well with using AI tool in one domain, there is a downstream effect to other areas as well. So if we are strategic about what are those areas that helps medicine or any other department all of us benefits uh, in the process. So that interconnected part is critical here. 
Um, and, you know, I think once you have few tools and a low hanging fruit where people get excited, they see success, suddenly you feel more alignment uh, from many members from the department. Uh, so I, I just want to pile on there for a second, Deshaun. I, I think you've hit on a key point um, that it's really important that as we begin to roll these out, that we're careful to pick those that are going to be successful and well received. Mm -hmm. I think if we, again, simply flip the switch on, uh, on some models uh, without really understanding sort of what the downstream effects are gonna be and the benefits and uh, providers don't embrace it, uh, that could, you know, sort of create a reluctance uh, for a general reluctance uh, for acceptance uh, of the of this technology. So again, I think you know I'd agree. You know we want to be careful. We want to be thoughtful, and um, you know pick areas where you know we can't have successes, and <laughs> clinicians will view that. And and some of that early on may not actually be in the clinical you know, sphere. It may be some of the back office stuff, like you've been doing. Where you know the the workflow that everyone really doesn't like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clinicians aren't really asking us day in day out. You know, I want some help making diagnoses, or I want some help, you know, figuring out therapies. What they're really asking for is, I want some help with all this work is being piled on me, so I can spend time making diagnoses and working on therapies. Um, you know, so it, we'll have to sort of think about, you know, where, where the targets are and not automatically assume they're yeah. already the very difficult clinical targets that we struggle with. Um, you know, it's like, you know, autonomous vehicles. I, I think, you know, the mistake was made to put, you know, everyone says, well, let's just put them on the freeway. Uh, that was a mistake. You know, we should have said, let's have them driving jitneys around the parking lots for a while uh, and figuring it out and understanding at five or 10 miles an hour. Uh, and then maybe we can let them go 60, um, but, uh, or drive in traffic. So, you know, I think, you know, we ought to walk before we run is, is sort of my view. Um, but that's again, my view. That's <laughs> great point, Sean, all you. Mark Phillips, do you want to make your comment that I think is related to this question? Yeah, I just, I recently I've been working with our department and, you know, getting Epic uh, up and running for our department. And the big question everyone asks is, you know, is it going to be more work? And I keep pushing for more structured data, but since, you know, they have to put in notes for billing and communication, uh, you know, there's always this tension. And so I think the workload problem really is important. I mean, if we're going to make progress in AI, we need more data, get more data. We don't want to, you know, alienate everyone that's uh, trying to work in, on the problem. Mark, I'm just going to make the one comment is for the Department of Radiology. This is precisely what we are thinking is what tools augments the role of radiologists and staff and the operations where it just makes their life easier and there is less controversy, not so much on the diagnostic side, managing the work list, you know, helping with triage, communication, types of things, which also takes a lot of a physician's time. And there is less disagreement on those things. You know, when you go more on the diagnostics, initially there is a concern, but once people get used to, Applying this, they realize there is tremendous value, and we can we can improve these these algorithms. So you make a very very important point. I agree with you. Mark. Mark, I also agree, and I, I think, um, you know, I think the physicians, and I, I I'm in this boat myself, feel like for the last, you know, two decades, for those of us who've been using EHRs for that long, uh, have been constantly asked to put in more and more data. And, and I don't think the clinicians have seen uh, dividends from that. Uh, in fact, you know, Epic is, you know, an information sink, right? We put tons of information in there, but it doesn't help us get any of that back out. I think the day that, you know, I walk into an exam room and the patient comes in with, you know, a complaint, be it knee pain, and suddenly on my screen, I see all the knee x-rays, 
all the visits related to knee pain, you know, just not even AI, but, you know, uh, information um, provision that the data that we've been putting in comes back out in some useful and structured way. I think clinicians would, you know, sign up. Okay, I'll put more data in, uh, but I, you have to make it easier for me to get to those data because Epic does not do that, nor does any EHR right now. Well, and some of the problem goes back to what was mentioned earlier is that the data input is flawed. I think that's the problem with all these EHRs. It's random people at random points putting in sometimes random information. And that's why it's basically rendered more or less unusable, but yet we keep putting the data in. So that's sort of where we're, where we're stuck. Um, I wanted to follow up on Harefield's question here about challenges and compounding unintended outcomes and see what others have to say. I, I think Steve already had shown this, this uh, freeway example, but I think this is another challenge and real opportunity for the medical field because I think in a very general way, you know, in a commercial setting, there's not as much concern around those. We clearly have that mandate and um, that mission of not creating more inequalities. And so again, I think an area for research, thoughtfulness, picking the right projects, be on top of it, getting stakeholders involved, really having people look at this and then roll it out and being nimble and adjusting. And I think that's actually something where we can really play a role if we say, we wrote this out thoughtfully, we thought about compounding unintended consequences, we looked at it, and then we refined because I don't know, and again, I'm not the expert on this, but I don't think that's being done in the outside world because it's really not necessary in their, in their eyes. Any of the other panelists wanna address that? Uh, it's Graham, I, I think the metaphor I would offer would be and I'm not suggesting every AI application is is related to diagnosis, but but I think there's a metaphor that that one can offer in that if we're um, using a lab test, uh, the lab is required to do uh, ongoing quality assurance. They just don't just make the test available and and let people use it um, with on an ongoing basis without periodic checking. I, I think, I do think that's an important piece. It's not the only piece, but it's an important piece. Yeah. Um, Chathan, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask your question. I think it's also a good one. Sure, yeah, if we go to it. Uh, yeah, my question was, uh, you know, we're creating these methods to make these predictions, but what about like the financial cost? Um, if an AI model is not reducing healthcare costs, how do we justify using this in a non-research institution like a county hospital? So let me, let me I, I, in one of the slides, I didn't, I didn't, uh, didn't point to this, but that, you know, one of the, I think, considerations is ROI. But I think R can be defined in many ways. And I think some mm -hmm. of the chat it on that. Uh, R can be financial, but it also can be quality, right? Uh, none of us will object to sp spending money uh, to improve care and save lives, right? Uh, mm -hmm. if we can do that. Um, but if we're spending money and, and uh, organizational capital, not just money, but time and um, patience and <laughs> morale and all the things we've talked about, um, there's got to be benefit. And, and I would agree with you. And, and you know, we've got to understand that's why you go through planning and that's why you go through evaluation uh, to assume that. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, we've been using AI in pockets for a long time, right? We all look at AI interpreted EKGs um, and we have for a long time and you know, we're all happy with them. And I think it saves time and money. And we use AI guided defibrillators and, 
you know, so we we have AI technology now that we're using, and I and I think all of us would consider it highly valuable. Um, it's just you know again thoughtful about where we put it and how we evaluate it. Um, so I, I you know I I would agree with you. I think those evaluations need to take place up front and ongoing, as Graham said. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, but you know. Uh, Finances are, are not the only thing, but I think hopefully something that, you know, as Dushan said, is that over time that will introduce efficiencies. Thank you. I would say Chitan too, um, like, like Steve said, there's, there's other outcomes. Another one is workforce. That's why I would say this is an opportunity to actually make the life of the workforce better. That would be a great outcome and we'd spend money on that. Um, so I think, Ian, the other one is, you know, scholarly engagement. It really is an opportunity for us to look at this in a thoughtful way, publish, disseminate, run models. That's worth spending money. So I think, but I think we have to define those outcomes. And I think Steve said this in the beginning, make clear that our, that our expectations are realistic, what we're trying to do with which uh, project and what, what the intended outcomes are. Barbara, one point there, what you mentioned is really great, is <clears throat> engaging uh, faculty not from your own disciplines, from other disciplines. And it gives an opportunity to collaborate, but also a find a career successes also. And a programmatic approach in the data science and AI is valuable for all of us because this is going to have a big impact on medicine. So I think finding those big problems how do we make physicians' life better? How do we make patient engagement better? How do we improve workflow? Will be some of the high value topics that we all have to consider. Well, I, I, I actually think that's a, uh, a acknowledgement or, or emphasis uh, on the value of the work that Sean and others have done over the last year or so in bringing these people together because we're bringing bringing us together because I, I, and I think for this to work, it needs to be not, not just data scientists, not just clinicians, but both. Thanks, Graham. I agree. We are just about to 2.30. Two um, so I, I think I'm going to wrap, wrap this up by re-sharing my uh, screen again about our next seminar. Um, so first of all, I, I really want to thank the four speakers today. I, this, this series would not be possible without you taking time to present to us. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, again, just as a reminder, uh, next week, we are going to have a, a presentation that will be a little bit off cycle. We're going to do it on the second Monday instead of the third because of the holiday. Really excited about Zach uh, Kohane, who is going to present um, a, cider, a seminar titled Finding the Doctor in Biomedical Informatics. And Zach is extremely well known, uh, both as a mentor for people who are in biomedical informatics all over the world now, um, as well as a thought leader in the area of the application of AI and data science and, uh, and the chair and founder of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. So I, I think this will be a really exciting presentation. So thank you so much for all the speakers that presented today and for the questions. And I really hope to see you uh, next week at Zach's talk. So thanks very much, everyone. Great.